Jahi, uh, Kepler oil and gas analyst joining us out of Paris, uh, and Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's managing editor for energy and commodities here in London. Mr. Falak Shahi, let's start with you, first of all, in Paris. Let's assume that the, uh, that the Americans are right and the Iranians are conducting a campaign against tankers in the Gulf of Oman and potentially spreading further around into the Straits of Hormuz. What does history tell us about the effect that this could have on pricing? Uh, thanks for having me, Guy, uh, first of all, uh, and hello. Um, I mean, as you said, you know, it's not the first time that we, we're seeing tension, tensions between uh, Iran and, and the U.S. in the region. In the past, we've seen Iran uh, many times, um, you know, uh, come up with threats that it could close the, the Strait of Hormuz. President Rouhani said this uh, multiple times. Now, I would be very cautious in, um, you know, looking at what exactly happened yesterday. Um, you know, we're a ship tracking comp uh, data, data analytics company. So far, obviously, we're not able to to see exactly what happened, what uh, exactly happened in terms of the attack. Uh, so I'd be very cautious in, in terms of this. What's really, I think, what really matters is the fact that uh, this happened just 130 kilometers away from the Strait of Hormuz, where uh, last month in May, 45 percent of the global seaborne oil trade passed through. Will, I, this is what's making headlines. But the biggest story is actually going on in the background, and it's the wider story about demand. In some ways, the, if there is, well, there are attacks going on, but, but if there is an effort to disrupt the oil story um, being driven by state actors, the timing couldn't be worse because everything else is pushing the price of crude down. That's right. It's interesting that the, the price reaction has been so mooted to what happened yesterday. I think in, in years when people felt that the market was tighter or more bullish, then we would have seen a much bigger reaction yesterday. And, and people have really started to get very nervous about the outlook for demand, the outlook for the global economy. We saw a very, very bearish IEA report yesterday, oh, sorry, earlier this morning, where they gave their first forecast for next year. And they say that OPEC would have to cut by 650,000 barrels a day just to balance the market. And that's with some very, very shall we say, generous assumptions about how much demand is going to grow in the rest of this year and next year. Will, how at risk are we of this escalating? Well, I think the significance in yesterday's event, uh, and as your other guest said, it's hard to read too much into it because the actual precisely what happened remains a bit murky. But the significance, I think, is that this is a second time in just a few weeks where shipping in the region has been attacked. If you remember in May, Vonnie, there were four ships mysteriously uh, with mysterious explosions just off Fajaro, also in the Gulf of Oman. So there is a concern in the industry that there may be a concerted or sporadic campaign against shipping, which will have... Um, which will have uh, implications to the shipping industry. And we've seen some reaction already in terms of some ship owners reluctant perhaps to sail through the Gulf of Hormuz until they have a better handle on what the security situation is. And we've certainly seen insurance premiums jump already. Thanks, Will. Just some breaking news for the moment. As you can see, Chewy has opened for trading, opening at $36 a share. It's at 37.13 now, another leg higher, up 70% from what it priced at. It priced at $22 a share, and it raised more than a billion dollars in what was already an upsized offering. So a very successful IPO there for Chewy, up 71% right now in just the first few minutes of trading. We spoke with the CEO a little earlier on who was very happy with the outcome. So let's get back now to the oil story, the Iran story. Homoyun Falak Shahi is with us. Homoyun, what will the Iranian foreign minister say? He tends to tweet just as much as uh, the president of the United States does sometimes. And sometimes they're not the most, you know, welcoming or warm of tweets. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, there's been a sort of battle of... Uh, of tweets uh, over the past few weeks between uh, Foreign Minister Zarif from Iran and, and U.S. officials. Um, now, again, you know, coming back to the oil story, I think uh, the market right now, it could be that the market is underestimating how much supply has been, has been taken out of the, of, the, of, the, of the oil market recently. I mean, just last, looking at last month in May, uh, we've seen OPEC decrease its uh, seaborne exports by more than five, almost 5%. And that's uh, the lowest level 
below 23 million barrels per day of uh, OPEC export. That's the lowest level in the past four years. Um, if you look, if you compare this with the end of uh, 2018, uh, that's actually the OPEC decreased its exports by 3 million barrels per day. So that's 3% of the global oil supply that has vanished. And at the same time, although we've seen a, a big increase in the first quarter in the oil price over the past two months, uh, we've seen a, a strong correction. And yesterday, even though the price increased today, it has actually since last time, the oil price has fallen back 2%. So again, I mean, I completely agree with you, with, um, um, with your order invitee, with, in, 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 the, in the sense that the market really seems to be driven by, by, the, by the demand situation right now rather than, than tightening supply. But again, supply is very much tightening. Homayun, how much crude is Iran getting out right now? So for the month of May, we've seen Iran loading about uh, 800, 000, a bit more than 800,000 barrels per day. Uh, and that's a bit less than 500,000 barrels per day, less than, than, the, than the previous month in, in April. So over the past six months, under the waiver period, Iran was able to load and export around 1.37 million barrels per day. So again, we've seen at export, sorry, load oil at around more than 800,000 barrels per day, but this doesn't mean that all of this oil will be exported. Uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to exactly tell the, the amount of this, of this oil that is going to be counted as, as exports. So as much, we think as much as 70, 75 percent of this volume could be used for floating storage. However, um, we've actually seen one tanker reach the shore of, of China just, uh, just yesterday, and we believe it's, it's actually it's, it's currently discharging its oil. Uh, so some of its oil, even now that the waiver period has been terminated, is actually reaching some of its customers. But definitely, uh, we've seen a lot less uh, Iranian oil uh, being loaded from, from Iran's shores than, than you know, the past few weeks, and even more compared to the previous, when, the previous period when the U.S. Was, uh, has, had not exited from the nuclear deal yet. Will Kennedy in London, at what point might some of the other OPEC plus countries weigh in? Will they stay away from this, from commenting on this, or will they see it as an opportunity to put their spoke in and, you know, have their say? Yeah, this comes at a delicate moment in relations between Iran and some other OPEC members, uh, Vonnie. I mean, in particular, there's a lot of tension between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And uh, without naming names, uh, Khalid Afala, the Saudi oil minister, was quick to condemn yesterday's attack um, after you know, as well he might, because most of his oil travels outside the Straits for moves. But that's absolutely right. And we're working towards an OPEC meeting, and we don't know when it's going to happen, because the Saudis and the Iranians can't even agree the date. So it's going to, there's some big policy decisions for OPEC to, meet, to make in the months ahead, especially if the uh, demand outlooks turns for the worse. And that's going to be hard with the tensions between Saudi and Arabia and Iran on a political level. It's interesting because Tina Davis here, our commodities head, was saying that, you know, that it wasn't even crude oil on these tankers, but the reaction was in the crude oil price. Do we see this spreading out to other hydrocarbons, other commodities? Um, well, if, if prices move higher, then the prices of all products will move higher. But it's the crude market that really matters. And I think that uh, where Tina's right is you may have seen more of a reaction had it been one of the very big VLCCs that carries crude oil out of the Gulf that was attacked. So far, it's been concentrated on smaller tankers. Um, but if we started seeing action uh, directed against those larger crude ships, then we might see a bit more of a reaction. A thought just occurred to me. Is there any chance that these attacks are designed to provide a smokescreen for Iran to get more oil out of the Gulf? Are you kind of look this way. I've heard don't it. Look, don't look that way. There seems to be a number of different kind of theories. I was, was going to say, Guy, I've heard a lot of conspiracy theories today about who it may have been, who it might have not have been. That's not, that's not one I've heard. I think that, you know, companies like Kepler and ourselves, we're, we're doing a lot of work keeping uh, track of the tankers coming out of the Gulf and um, although there are instances where they do uh, turn off their transponders I'm not sure that this would help them do it. We're going to leave it there. Plenty of conspiracy <laughs> theories. Got to love a conspiracy <laughs> theory. Homoyo and Falak Shahi, uh, Kepler joining us uh, out of Paris. Uh, oil and gas analyst there and Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. Thank you very much indeed. Vonnie. All right, let's take